Ah, Dublin. Town of saints, sinners and scholars. People travel here from all over the world. They come to check out the sights, the great pubs, the beer, the history. Perhaps some come for those Irish Colleens, or to walk in the footsteps of their favourite writers. Maybe it's the music that draws them. Lord knows, we have plenty of that. But there's another type of traveller that comes to these shores. No, not sex tourists. People who are searching for something else. To step off the beaten track. To brave the elements, searching high and low for that most elusive of things. Their favourite film locations. And if you're lucky, and you try hard enough, you might just find it. And then you can sit back and let your imagination flow. Here in Hallowed Ground, Sergio Leone shot here, what, 51 years ago, and I have to say, before we get into any of the details of this flick, of all the directors that I've admired throughout my life, Leone's one of those directors who keeps rising in my estimation the older I get, where now he's on my Mount Rushmore of favorite filmmakers, and I guess when I think of what art or great storytelling should aspire to be, I can't remember who said this, but like, Art at its best eventually takes on almost like the qualities of music and when you look at the the films of Leone, especially seeing like the one in this room, it does take on those qualities of like operatic, pure visual storytelling where, I mean I'm getting goosebumps right now even mm. just remembering it, it just chills flow through your body as you see a scene like that where just the, the music and the image and the storytelling all are just in perfect harmony. And it's, I think it's the acme, it's, it's the zenith of cinematic storytelling, but uh, am, I, am I overstating the case? For a ducky sucker. Yeah, I don't know. I, I think I'd agree. I think it's an underestimated movie. You know, like only an idiot would say that it's Sergio Leone's best movie. So I'm going to say it's Sergio Leone's best movie because I'm an idiot. Uh, you know, it's the one I return to more and more. Um, and I think it's very difficult for me or for Robert people who are Irish because I I, rem- I would remember like this, there is an extra sort of affection for it because it, it would have been something I'd have come across cable or what we are equivalent of cable you're flicking through the channels one night and oh this is the western oh it's exciting oh there's a coach and it's blowing up and the guy gets off the motorcycle and is he trying to do an Irish accent? Oh I don't need any help from you to know I've been screwed I mean that sounds like an <laughs> approximation of an Irish and then you realise oh yeah he is and he put, they pull out all the stuff he out of his bag he spent five whole weeks in Ireland yeah, that uh, and, and, and he manages to uh, incorporate every single region of, the, of those five places <laughs> that he visited into that accent which, which kind of makes it a bit of a a bit of a pudding, um, but you kind of you, you let him away with it because he's he looks really cool, and he looks like a guy that you would see in a bar in Ackle Island or somewhere. Like he looks so Irish, especially when he's wearing the old polo neck in the flashback. 
yeah, I, I, I just uh, love it. That, that, that really adds something to it to me, the, the whole Irish angle and the fact that he was interested in a revolution, the Mexican revolution, like, like that early, like between sort of 1915 to 1920 is kind of when all, when the revolution, you know, um, Rod Steiger has the line, oh, it seems like revolutions happen everywhere. You have one, we have one. It's just, as, you know, Russia had one. Uh, in Ireland, we kind of like, there's, there's a rumour that the, the Russian Revolution was inspired two years later by the 1916 Revolution. So there's a whole historical sweep to it. And obviously the fact that the fact that there's an Irish angle really brings you along. But what's interesting to me being here is, uh, I was just, because I watched the end of the movie last night, uh, and I heard that they'd actually cut out that final flashback in the, in the, US in the original cut, yeah. US cut, which is obviously completely, you know, you're left kind of a bit befuddled, you know, you, should, you shouldn't mess around with these things. But when you see it, it's, um, I was just delighted that they came here to, to, to make it because you wonder, why did they bother? Why did they come to Ireland? In you know, like they didn't go to America, like they're, they're in Andalusia or Almeria pretending to be in America. Now they needed somewhere that looks like Ireland when they just slip across the border to Switzerland or something. And, and apparently John Borman came on very briefly as a consultant for locations mm. and helped them decide on tenors. Okay, well, yeah, an amazing call. And for years people thought that... Uh, because I know Christopher Frayling released a book on it, and uh, he's because no, no one was quite sure, sort of pre-internet days where everyone knew it was toners, but they weren't sure where the uh, the car flashback with the three of them in the car, uh, and a lot of people thought it was Wicklow, and I presume they thought it was Wicklow because Borman lived down there, and, and everything gets filmed in Wicklow. Yeah. But it was actually just half an hour out on the dart in uh, Hoth, little fishing village, and it was Hoth Castle, and that because it's a kind of castle grounds, pr pretty much unchanged there as well, and this. Again, the great thing about this place being that it's one of Dublin's original Victorian bars and that it is, even though, because we were there last night, there's a monstrous addition to the back of it, the front bar still has that same, you know, pretty much the same topography as when they would have been standing here, Coburn. And we, also, we get three separate flashbacks here throughout mm. the movie. First, we get during the days of all their youthful exuberance mm -hmm. and they're all very optimistic and you get to see the positive side of when people are in full-blown revolutionary mode and then we get to see the dark side, the finger pointing, mm -hmm. and then we finally get to see friend versus friend or almost brother versus brother, I mean, basically almost like the, the same name, but we get to see almost like these different stages of like the revolutionary spirit all in the context of toners, which is kind of fascinating, but I, when it goes to that final scene at the end, out in the green, when it's just like, it's all going in slow motion, and you know, James Coburn keeps moving in for the big smooches and everything, the fact that that was cut is just staggering because it's like almost the emotional soul and core of the film. That is the climax of the film. It'd be like cutting the final shootout in The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly or something like that. Like, how do you remove the, the climax of the film? And I would argue that, yeah, the best scenes of the movie actually are the Irish flashbacks in terms of the music and it's all pure visual storytelling not a word is spoken and it's just to get back to basics like how do you communicate the emotions of a story just with actors faces and music and it's just a, a master class in visual storytelling yeah I think it's his most political film and it's basically the three stages of a revolution you have the youthful exuberance you know we're going to do that you see and it, you get the impression it almost looks like it's upstairs here like are they the, in the snook when he's passing out the pamphlet I think, the, I uh, think the it might be in the snug but like the, the snug yeah because we passed O'Neill's yesterday and I do know because I know the fella's family who owns that that the old the, the original IRA like Michael Collins and those used to or they would have been the IRB it's funny they take the flag out and it says IRA Technically, I think it should be IRB. It was like Irish Republican Brotherhood at that stage. But, you know, these are small historical details. But uh, they would generally meet upstairs in pubs to sort of plan the revolution. And they have all that detail, right? The army uniforms seem really authentic and everything. Everyone in the pub looks completely, like, brilliantly cast. But you have the, the youthful exuberance of... And then... You have the that becoming sullied by the fact that people are informing and you know you're following Coburn's journey to sort of world weary and then at the end with Viega when he we're, it's funny it, it kind of reminded me of the Oscars when Eli Kazan was getting his uh, honorary Oscar and some people want to make a point of not you know they're making a point of saying I wouldn't have done that you know but but nobody knows like nobody knows how they'll ever react in a fight or a bar brawl or whatever happens you know you, you can imagine it but to be there and like Coburn kind of he goes that full cycle in the film because we go back to see him in his youthful exuberance of the three stages of the revolution it's something that's Leone's 
own personal journey as well. He grew yeah. up in a socialist family, and in the late 60s, he was becoming, I wouldn't say cynical and jaded, but he was starting to second guess some of the mythologies yeah. of revolution. And in the movie, through Rod Steiger, the contrast between Rod Steiger and James Coburn, we get both sides. And yeah. Rod Steiger says, yeah, the people with the books convince the people who don't have the books to go, go out and fight, and they're dead. And like that, that's his attitude. But what I love is seeing how you get these scenes where Rod Steiger, through no fault of his own, becomes a hero of the people. I mean, he frees 150 political prisoners mm -hmm. in the bank, and he's just, he's so frustrated. Every door that he opens, he's expecting piles of gold and money, and just keeps finding more and more political prisoners, not a, no, not a dollar to be found in the entire place. And then, of course, he gets you know, carried away by this swell of people at the end. So it's not a purely cynical movie, because you get to see how these folk heroes are born and created, even if they're just common crook. Yeah, and it's it's funny. A lot of the movie is it's funny. Hysterical. You know, it's hysterical. And there's like all these amazing, like so many visual gags. Like we've got the poster of the guy who's the governor of the town. The little fingers come in, and you know his eyes. Are there. Like so many visual gags. Like it's the whole thing of the iron fist and the velvet glove. If you're gonna try and put a little bit of politics into, you know, if it's purely politics. Everyone's bored twenty minutes in, but you're never bored in this movie. It's yeah. just it's the certainly the only movie I've watched more than any of the others, like by a considerable degree. You know, I've watched I own it on Blu ray or whatever and watched it loads of times. Um but yeah, you just you, you, you get to see that whole sort of um bizarre, kooky, crazy uh journey from idealistic revolutionary. And uh, as you're saying with the with the whole thing, uh, when when Rod Steiger makes that speech about the people with the books, tell the people without the book. And Coburn's reading the book and he goes, you know, this guy has a point. He just fucking throws it away. <laughs> and that's, that's the sort of policy. And then when you see the book again, it is in the mud and it's being driven over by yeah. an armored car. And it, it almost, that book leads the army to, like, it, it, it's the evidence that oh, we're on the right trail. It's like words are powerful and, you know, they can, they can get you dead. Well, one of the things that I find remarkable about Ducky Sucker is comparing it to... Fistful of Dollars, which came out only like eight or nine years prior, where you start to see the scale and the ambition and the scope of Leone's productions getting bigger and bolder and grander, where he almost had that David Lean complex where he wasn't ever satisfied. He had to go bigger each time out, whereas Clint Eastwood was happy to go into smaller films like Play Misty for Me and things like that. And I think the scene that exemplifies this the most is when you see these enormous trenches where people are being executed all as a train rolls in. And the shot's maybe 30, 40, 50 seconds, but the amount of work and the amount of orchestration, the amount of coordination that would have been required for that, just an enormous amount of labor just to give you a little background information, a little background flavor. But it's one of the one of many reasons why Leone's our great operatic Wagnerian director, just bigger and bolder all the time. And um, yeah, it just it just floors me each time each time out. If there was ever going to be a director who could do Homer's The Iliad or Wagner's The Ring, Sergio Leone is that guy. And I, it's I guess eventually maybe his reach exceeded his grasp, and then it all started to kind of come unwound with the Once Upon a Time in America, where the film got taken away from him and then horribly butchered. But with Ducky Sucker. It's all still intact and as he intended it to be. Although apparently it's like forty minutes shorter than even he originally wanted it to be. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there, there, it is, it is, it's long, but it doesn't, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't, uh, it's not flabby at any stage. But it's, it, the, the whole um, corralling of the extras and everything is just insane. I watched that last night. You're, I, I'm always thinking, like, what's that guy, you know, like five miles away? That guy with the gun. What's he up to? You know, the, the, the logistics are just unbelievable and it makes you wonder what he would have done like how much bigger could you get if he'd been around for another 20 30 years like clint maybe he would have sort of turned back in and because i like but i mean i love the sort of spare uh clint eastwood's later films of you know time is ticking out so let's only do two takes i mean i, I love both but but you're right the the uh, the sheer operatic excess of Ducky Suckers is just unbelievable every time you watch it. And it, there's, it, with, with no CGI, no nothing, although there are mo the model trains, you can kind of see when they, when they collide to, into each other there. I, I think that's a bit of a scale electrics um, Hornby train set, but everything else, like thousands, like every uniform and the embroidery on the uniforms of someone who's that size on a, on a, on a huge wide screen is yeah. incredible. And you have to transport them, you have to feed them, you have to house them. I mean, it is a truly a, a type of filmmaking from a bygone era that is no longer economically feasible. These movies with casts of thousands where you just feel like you're watching 
entire chapters of history go by before your eyes. And I wish they'd stuck with the original name, Once Upon a Time, The Revolution. I feel like mm. that would, it would make his Once Upon a Time trilogy feel like its own trilogy, equal to that of the Man With No Name trilogy. Mm. But for whatever reason, Ducky Sucker kind of, it slips through the cracks in a lot of ways. And I think that's because for a long time in America, it was just a crummy pan and scan VHS that was truncated by like 30 minutes or so. But luckily, thankfully now, it's beautifully restored, it's available on Blu-ray, and people can rediscover it for the masterpiece that it is. Yeah, I think as well, because it has, like, the name cheapens it, and I was watching it, like, the name is burnt in on the end titles, Ducky Sucker comes up, is this idea that Leone had that this was a phrase that you Americans use all the time. You say, hey, Ducky Sucker. Constantly. Constantly. <laughs> and because uh, it came out around the time of, like, the sort of, like, those Terrence Hill, Bud Spencer comedies, and it has a name like Duck You Sucker, you kind of imagine that they'll be speeded up and slowed down sequences and that it'll be a bit slapstick scenes, yeah. and yeah, pulling the gun out of the holster and slapping the guy. It cheapens the movie, which is actually, you know, about Maoism and revolutionaries and, and all this That's another thing that was cut in America, that Chairman Mao quote at the yeah. beginning about how kind of that. a revolution is not a tea party, it's yeah. not a conversation, yeah. it is an act of violence. Yeah, yeah. It, remi it reminds me of the, the, the Chandler quote where, he, you know, he said when he was writing crime fiction, he wanted to sort of... <laughs> wrestle it away from the, the Agatha Christie types, the cucumber sandwiches and the watercress and bring it back to, you know, the, the filth and the, the squalor where these sort of murders usually happen. It's, it's like, it's really important, that quote at the start of the film. It puts the whole thing in context, but you wouldn't see that quote at the start of a Bud Spencer movie. So you can imagine it being yeah, hacked down and, and turned into a sort of almost a zany comedy, but it's, it's great to see it now restored and looking amazing and almost at its full length. Yeah. Any uh, tales from the trenches about Rod Steiger's legendary battles with Sergio Leone on the set? Uh, apparently they had a, a contrasting work styles and he obviously very method and eventually apparently he was very satisfied when he saw the final results. On no, no director was ever friendlier to his actors than Leone in terms of how, depicting mm. them in their, their grandeur. Mm. But I know there was some friction there out in the desert. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think Eli Wallach was supposed to play the part and he was strung along for a while. Neither neither Steiger or Coburn were supposed to be in the movie. They just kind of fell into it. Um, and Steiger was like, I mean, obviously tune of scenery and it's, it's ridiculously over the top and it's okay. 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 His uh, Hispanic uh, acting is kind of almost t totters on ridiculousness but he, I, apparently they only wanted him to be bigger, bigger, bigger all the time. And he was like, no, no, this is going to veer off. I mean, you look at it now, he was right. You know, he knew the material almost better than Leone did what he was dealing with. It could, you know, if he went into completely insane Rod Steiger, it would be a parody and the movie would look ridiculous now, you know? I when James so. Coburn's character is introduced, setting off dynamite at random, it's like, why is he just blowing up the desert haphazardly yeah. Yeah, no, to I, make a grand entrance for yeah. people he's planning on just riding on by? Yeah. It's a little over the top, it's but very, I love it's, it. It's very over the top, yeah. He's just, he's, you can just imagine him on his motorbike, like with a cigar, just lighting sticks of dynamite <laughs> and throwing them left, It's like something out of Raising Arizona, like shooting rabbits and he, sort of off the back yeah. of the motorcycle. And of course he has his little nitroglycerin, you know, and he, he tells him that if he, if, if he falls over, they'll have to change the maps because there'll be a big crater there and uh, that could be you know offensive stereotype of the Irish as well, the, uh, he, he drops it but it's like you're going to blow yourself up yeah. you're, you're covered in your <laughs> anyway you just got to kind of roll with you're it lose your foot. to bring things back to toners mm. I mean there he is on the wall mm. holding the shotgun rehearsing the scene does it do, do anything for you just knowing that the great man himself uh, we are quite literally walking and shooting in his footsteps mm. here in this location yeah it's amazing it's like a as you say a sacred little corner um i love the idea and i i imagine they probably stayed in the shelburne up the road and I, I like to think that they had a an uproarious time the like weekend or whatever that they were here and uh, yeah i just i just love the fact that the place is so intact and as it was if you could have one drink with leone right here what would that drink be oh my god uh, well i think it would have to be pint of guinness because they do a savage mighty pint of guinness here fantastic as you uh, found out last night so um, yeah i think that would be it i'd have to convince him although he'd probably take one sip and spit it out and order a chianti or something <laughs> i think possibly
Alright, well Simon, we tackled this on wrong reel a year and four months ago for our big Christmas, Christmas special. special. But here we are at the dead house. So as somebody who can recite that short story word for word, what is it what does it mean to you standing here on hallowed ground, being here in front of the, the, the dead house? Yeah, it's uh, it's mixed feelings really because uh, if you have a look around at it it's quite dilapidated and it's been the it's been the subject of um, various stories about is it going to be restored or sold or anything. I think it's a, I mean, th this is where uh, Joyce's two aunts would have every year on the Feast of the Epiphany, they would have this big dinner and uh, loads of people would come and there would be speeches and music and songs and everything and that's what gave them the inf inspiration for the story. And the fact that it still exists in Dublin uh, is a bit of a miracle really, you know, and it's a shame that it hasn't been like bought by a the James Joyce Museum or something. Yeah, kind of, well, yeah. There, there, there is a James Joyce Museum uh, up in North Great George's Street, but the fact that it, it somehow survived through the 80s and 90s and is still there, uh, it would be nice to think that they could do something that the state could compulsory, compulsory purchase it, uh, put a CPO on it, and turn it into some sort of arts interpretive centre. I know that's always like not very financially viable, but there was uh, there been the, the latest talks pre-pandemic was it's going to be turned into a youth hostel you know and you can just imagine the sort of little cut out of James Joyce by the coffee machine and all they that sort of thing. They should host like the dead cosplayer parties where you get to have like they, poetry restaurants they, they and did that. They did that but like maybe 10 years ago there gotcha. was, there was, it was restored to a certain st uh, uh, state but it's been allowed to kind of fall into a, a state of dilapidation and I, I think it kind of says a lot about where Ireland's how it treats its culture, like we always kind of, we'll always take our writers or we'll sell the tea towels with the pictures of them, but most of them had to leave the country to make a living or, or even to, to have their books published in a country where they weren't going to be yeah. banned. But so many countries are, can be blasé about their own arts where they kind of casually disregard them, but for me as someone who's, I wouldn't say a literary you know, expert, but as an enthusiast or as, as a fan, and somebody who read the short story again recently and was just blown away, mm -hmm. in an era of the internet and you know online strife and TikTok and all this nonsense, make the case for why reading the dead is still so, such, such a special experience. Because for me, there's nothing quite like an artist coming along and just through their style and their word choice, picking you up and carrying you along where you just feel like your soul soaring, and, and it's just it's just the voice. It's all they have. No music, no special effects, no anything. So just, I guess, how, why is The Dead still relevant now, 2022, all these years later, as such a masterpiece of literary fiction? Yeah, God, I don't know. I mean, I, I think The Dead is one of those stories that, when, like, when you read it, you have to put the book aside for a minute and take a moment to yourself. It's kind of that powerful. And obviously, it's called The Dead. It's all, it's about mortality. And it's about, We're all becoming so, shades of ourselves. Yeah, and, the, and, you know, it's a big subject to tackle, and, you know, you shouldn't take it on unless you got the chops to do it, which he does. But uh, I think it was interesting that we were talking about um, Leone this morning and how his movies were getting bigger and bigger and more expansive. And then you come really with full circle to the dead. It's a movie that's like Houston who has a finite amount of time. He's on oxygen, he's running around. He, he's got a tunnel that's narrowing and everything is coming smaller and smaller, shorter and shorter takes. It's almost like uh, it's it's Eastwood esque, you know, but it but it, it more more literary, uh, more lyrical, uh, and it just pairs everything down to the bare bones of like honesty and truth and uh, what it is to uh, to be mortal and to, to have to suffer through this life and uh, and uh, it's all those big themes that um, are very complex, but we're all going to have to deal with them. And for you as Houston the man for the job to bring this story to life because for me from the Maltese Falcon up to the dead you've basically got a 45 year career as a director not even mentioning his early screenwriting credits basically a 50 year career but you can count on one hand how many directors have a 50 year career where they start and finish strong what is it about his interpretation of the material that works for you? Well I, I think uh, the thing is like uh, I think Cassavetes and Houston are two directors who finish strong Love Streams and the Dead and the Dead uh, I almost, you almost don't appreciate the craft of it when you watch it the first couple of times. But there's a, a lot of Irish films, sometimes you watch an Irish film and you go, oh God, that's a bit dated, or oh, you know, I met, but for me the dead is completely the opposite because I told you before, they, they, they have an annual screening uh, on, the, day, on the, the Feast of the Epiphany in the IFR Irish Film Institute. And every time I see it, I enjoy it more. You know, it's definitely grows me. This is 
zeker in. <laughs> and uh, 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 I, I like, I love the fact um, that there are all these little touches that are subtle. You kind of forget them, and then when you watch it the second time, like when uh, one of the aunts is singing "Arrayed for the Bridal," there's this lovely, almost sort of Scandinavian uh, sequence where the camera just tracks through the house, and you see all these black and white photographs. They might have medals in front of them, and you. It's a really uh, 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 lyrical moment. It's really intelligent. Like it's it's saying that that's, the corridors are filled with ghosts and uh, the coats are all on the bed. You know the furs and the mink stoles and everything like that. And I think you know it's not flashy. There's a little few few touches like that, but whatever they are, they're completely part of the story. Whereas the rest of it is all just pared down to the bone. It is uh, there's not an ounce of. Uh, there's, there's, all the, there's all this opulent food on the table, like jellied... No applesauce! No applesauce! No applesauce, yeah. Well, I think with John Huston, he's maybe the best example I can think of of how to do literary adaptations well. It's, everybody likes to turn trashy books into good movies, whether it's Jaws or The Exorcist. Mm. Really hard to turn literature into a good movie because you lose the essence of what made the literature special in the first place. But he was able to tackle Rudyard Kipling, and I think what he realized it's better to take a short story and expand it into a movie mm. than take a giant tome and strip it away and strip it down to its bare essentials. And I always look to John Huston, it's like, yeah, if you want to learn how to adapt good books well, he's the guy. He's the guy, because he, he did it again and again and again. And he just, yeah, finished, he started and ended his career with great book adaptations. He was the master. Yeah, and uh, I mean, he, he, he uh, it, it's an, like, it, 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 it almost takes an American to take on Joyce because you know there's a there's a there's a great uh, film adaptation of Lucy starring Milo O'Shea, but I think it's done by a Belgian or is, uh, I'm probably wrong about that, but uh, someone not from Ireland. The idea of taking on Joyce is almost too much for an Irish director. It'd be great to see someone Irish. But it's too uh, invested, it yeah. Yeah, and and like all writers imagine Joyce at their shoulder kind of thing. It's, it's, it's why we have so many bad Hemingway movies. Exactly, exactly. But uh, another amazing thing about the film is the casting, which we were just talking about there. All these, I think it's great that all these, th th there are a lot of Abbey players, guys who have been in the Abbey in the 40s and 50s, uh, and women, who, were, who had uh, earned their chops and then, you know, like, like got up a, a stage reputation, but got them to Hollywood to get an agent and then they would turn up in Hawaii 5 or they would turn up in an episode of Magnum, you know, the Dan O'Hurleys and people like that. And then they get to be in this like amazing lyrical uh, movie that's just like something that they would have done back in the Abbey at the start of their career. So it's great to see what like a uh, Helena Carroll who plays uh, Aunt Julia. I was just looking up, she, uh, I said, where do I know her from before? Because I've watched that film so many times. Uh, she's Eddie Coyle's wife in The Friends of Eddie Coyle. She's gotcha. Robert Mitchum's wife. You know, you see all these like hard-working actors and actresses. I just think it's or great. Or babyface Colomini. Yeah. yeah, yeah, or young Colomini and uh, young, uh, young um, uh, Rachel uh, uh, Allen, you know, uh, Rachel Dowling, the uh, daughter of the theatre director. Yeah, it's it's great that they get this swan song in this just beautiful, lyrical, amazing movie that will. Uh, tear your heart out. Well, so for outsiders, we always think about and hear about Dublin as a city for musicians, a city for artists. And you see this movie, and it's like the perfect Christmas party, where it's, whether it's poetry or music or playing the piano or just dancing, this is a house that thrives on art and culture and the celebration of music. Or even the character of Gabriel, he's a literary critic. And it's mm. like everybody's involved in the arts to one degree or another. And I guess um, it makes me, I guess it, it's the perfect idealized version of Dublin as an outsider looking in. Like that's what you want Dublin to be. Yeah, yeah. It's all, it's all there. Like the, the evening takes along. Like there's never. Like the film is. I think it's 80 something minutes. It's really spare. But yeah. Very entertaining. Even though it's a, a, a literary tome that they're uh, a little literary story that, that they're uh, adapting. But there's food, there's drink, exactly, there's food, there's drink, there's talking, there's banter, there's back and forth. A little there's politics. A little bit of politics, a bit of uh, internet, you know, which, which are obviously, as you mentioned on the podcast, that whole West Brit thing was, uh, was back in the news when, when I was watching the film. So it's, al it's always, um, always relevant. But um, it's just a great little slice and a great, you know, it's not intimidating because it's, a, it's a, such a short, delectable little meal. So in the final analysis, where would you rank this relative to some of John Huston's other classics? Because mm. obviously you've got Maltese Falcon, Treasure of the Sierra mm. Madre, movies like Moby Dick, but obviously like Fat City and The Man Who Would Be King or Under the Volcano. 
is it in the pantheon of great John Huston films? And is it in the pantheon of great just literary adaptations on the film? Um, I'm not sure because, you know, like, I mean, I love, you know, The Asphalt Jungle and I love The African Queen, and, you know, Treasures Here, Matter, and all those movies so much. And it's so different to that. I, mean, I gotta say that in terms of Irish films, for me, this is the greatest Irish film ever made. And uh, it kind of alternates between The Butcher Boy and The Dead as being the two. And they're both from two incredible literary sources. It's interesting, you know, that, like the, 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 the material is there if you don't fuck it up too much, you know, if you, if you, if the material is there to be, to be brought to life uh, in two totally different movies. And I kind of alternate between number one and number two on the, on the, on the list. And, but I just think both of those movies get better every time you watch them. Like I was saying earlier, some Irish movies, they creak a bit when you watch them and that's part of the charm of them. But this is something that just, he just did something so, he was so deep. He was almost, he almost had one foot on the other side when he was making it. And he was showing us yeah. the way there. Uh, so when you watch it, you just, it just reveals a little bit more to you every time. So uh, never, a, never a bad time to watch the dead. underestimate the power of the commitments when it blasted onto the screens back in 1991. I mean, here in Dublin, um, I was in college just around the corner here. Um, we're on Camden Street now. This was this was the uh, location for the commitments rehearsal space. But when the when the commitments arrived on the screens, like Ireland was coming out of like a 30, 30 years of the troubles, um, bombs, IRA, all that sort of stuff. Unemployment was rife, like really, really high rates of unemployment, so it was quite a depressing period and suddenly this film comes and it's a film that depicts Ireland or a, a Dublin that was a Dublin that I was familiar with, you know, and uh, before that mo most of the kind of screen versions of Ireland were uh, Darby O'Gill and the Little People or The Quiet Man or th those sort of things, so to see yourself represented on screen in the form of Jimmy Rabbit and, who, and the gang, um, it, it just blew me away and, and not just me but all my friends, all my companions, you know, um, you couldn't go anywhere in 1991. You couldn't go to a house party without hearing the commitment soundtrack blasting through the speakers. It had such a huge impact. And what made it even better was it carried across the water. It, it, you know, it wasn't just an Irish phenomenon. It, 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 the US, the UK, all over the Europe, everyone loved the commitments, you know. And so um, when we first talked about uh, two years ago, Obviously, the commitments was a high on the agenda, and I, I, I was delighted to find that you were also a fan. Fanatic, yeah. <laughs> well, I was a 15-year-old kid when it came out, and I always looked to my older brother to kind of find out what was cool in terms of music. He was a fan, so through him I discovered it, and I just watched it over and over and over again on VHS. So I had no knowledge of Ireland going into it. So I had a completely different experience because it was my first Irish movie. I was a blank slate, so that was my first impression of Dublin, but what a first impression to get because... The music in that movie still is just bone chilling to this day. That's my favorite version of Try a Little Tenderness. I know that's heresy to say. I'm well aware that Otis Redding did a great version as well. But if I'm going to hear Try a Little Tenderness, that's the version I want to hear to my dying day. And the way it booms at the credits, you're just like, it's a fucking movie. That's it's it's the ultimate just crowd pleasing entertainment with so many kick ass songs, so many kick ass characters, quotable as hell. The screenplay is just pure gold, and I think. Is it Alan Parker's best movie? Yeah, I mean, like, the film could have been a disaster. If the, if the music didn't work, it would have just been a big pile of shit that would have been quickly forgotten. But the fact that he, he hunted high and low, trying to get the best young musicians that he could find, and that basically the whole band is a whole band. They all play music except for the, the actor who played Joey the Lips. Um, but, but everyone else is a musician, and that's what makes the film, because uh, it's believable, you know? And uh, if, if it had been some sort of, like, uh, 
miming and faking playing the guitars and stuff like that it just wouldn't have worked and of course like be, you know being Irish like I, I grew up on films like Alan Parker's film Bugsy Malone where he'd also dealt with young, younger people the, um, wall. The, the, the wall you know and um, so of course um, I, he was just coming off the um, Angel Heart and uh, Mississippi Burning you know so this he was a huge director and for him to, to be interested to come to Dublin and, and make a film about a, a young Dublin band it really it, it was amazing and it, it really added to the, the quality of the film and yes Alan Parker I mean uh, those other films I mentioned I do I, I, did, I loved them you know but it, it's got to be the commitments you know and um, he's, in it, he's in it himself he, he has a cameo appearance at the very end he, he's the engineer who's recording the, uh, the Deco character who throws the pint of Guinness at the, at the yeah. window he, he, he's the engineer from uh, Egypt Records or whatever it is you know but um, yeah absolutely it's, it, it's a fantastic and I think it took an outsider you know to come and do it, it would, I, I don't know if Neil Jordan or, or, or uh, Jim Sheridan would have made as, as good a, a film because um, Parker had the record of working with children you know what I mean or yeah, working with young with young people. And fame as well, yeah. he also done fame. But well, what I love about the scene here is the first time they play Mustang Sally in this room and it's so rough and it, it's hard to play music slightly incorrectly, convincingly, but then you get the contrast between the first version of Mustang Sally to the very end of the movie when they play it again, you're like, oh my God, and everything is flowing. The girls are like dancing in unison, they're so sexy and they're just Bell and Ride instead of Royd, Sally it's Ride. Not, it's not Ride, Sally Ride, it's Ride, Sally Ride. Exactly. You know? but, just, but to see that transition or like the before and after contrast, like yeah. this band is just, it's flowing. They're in their flow state and of course, doomed to fail. Yeah. That's, that's the poetry. Well, yeah, you do see the band coming together. You see them you, slow. It's, it's like, I don't know, that, that uh, Beatles Get Back uh, that came out last year, you know, you see them slowly coming together with the album and there is that same sort of energy in the film that you see the band coming together because they do, that, that's what they did in real life. They got to, slowly got to rehearse together and become familiar with each other and by the end, they're, they're a band and a full-fledged musician, a rock and roll band, you know. Yeah, it's so tight. Yeah. And, and this location, it, it, it's changed. What, what, back in the day, it was Ricardo's pool hall, and uh, there were snooker tables upstairs and downstairs, pool tables, and uh, it's all gone. I, I, was, I, I lived at almost 20 years out of the country, and when I came back, I was walking down Camden Street, and I had to do a double take, because Ricardo's was now the Camden Deluxe Hotel, you know, and it's been uh, gentrified in a way, but they've, they've kept the original ornate ceiling, and uh, it looks spectacular, as you can see, you know. All the locations used in the commitments, there's, there's not many of them left, you know. Like, um, Dublin has totally been transformed since, since early, the early 90s, especially along the Keys, but there are some locations that are, have been, haven't changed in 100 or 200 years, one of which is behind us, which is the, uh, it's the, the official residence of the Lord Mayor of Dublin. But in the commitments, it was the hotel where Wilson Pickett was staying, and uh, Jimmy the Rabbit and uh, Joey the Lips come here, and the intent with the intention of asking um, uh, Wilson Pickett to come and jam with them that, that, that night, and of course um, Joey the Lips, who, who's a bit reluctant to, to let Jimmy accompany him uh, to, to, to see, because there's a, a little bit of bad, bad blood between them. Back in 1991, the shop behind me which is now the Shack Restaurant. It, it, was, um, it was the pawn shop in the Commitments where uh, uh, the, the, the drummer has, has pawned his drum kit and, and Jimmy the Rabbit wants to make sure he can play it before he'll pay the money to unpawn it, you know? So it's a, it's a, a, a nice, funny scene. I think you, you like that scene. Oh, I love it, but what it reminds me of most at that part of the movie is it's almost like an old action film from the 70s where you're assembling a gang of people to go on a mission, but instead they all play an instrument. Like they, first, they find like the bass player and the, the guitar player, and like they see like the singer at the uh, at the wedding reception, and like of course they keep finding people here and there. But it's like, oh, y'all are a bunch of people about to go on a mission. And finally, once you have like the commitment eps and so on and so forth, the gang's all there. But I guess those early days or those early scenes are so much damn fun, where the group is like talking all animatedly with each other. They're excited. They're walking on their bridges, and there's just so much enthusiasm and so much excitement and so much optimism and of course there's little cracks when they just start talking mad shit to each other throughout the movie and they you know they speak in a very unfiltered way but of course like it gets increasingly nasty as it goes but I just love those early scenes where like this band is just destined for greatness but of course that's the beautiful part of the movie is that it's a few gigs and that's it but like that's what makes them such a legendary band is that either you were there for those for those gigs or you were not and like or you missed you missed the whole phenomenon yeah
So uh, Johnny Murphy, who, he's actually um, he di he died a few years ago. Johnny Murphy was the, uh, the the non musician of the group who plays the most convincing music musician of the group. You know, you really buy the the, the fact that he he was uh, he played with all these greats over the years. You know, whether he, Stevie Wonder, the pup. You know, the, uh, the 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 story that he tells about Elvis to Colomini's character is uh, so it's brilliant. You know, with the with the with the the horn and the, and the Vern, Vernon Presley. You know, and uh, I just love his character. You know. He, he, everybody in the, everybody in Ireland has somebody like him in their family. You know the the Aaron brother, the the the, the, the black sheep of the family, and uh, he, jo Johnny Murphy really pulls it off. And it's a, it's an essential ingredient to the commitments. Is this kind of grounding force that he brings, part hippie, part guru, um, and of course mentor and. Uh, fantastic horn player you know yeah you know he's my favorite part of the movie I really like him the most I mean he is certainly the most experienced actor they had on the cast um, and he had a long career in Irish uh, cinema and he gives you this credibility also there's a little bit of mystery because a guy comes in and starts talking about all these people he jammed with and the, at first the, the wonder is is this guy bullshitting us clearly uh, he seems like he's walking the walk, but you know, is he? Is he? He's, he's, we know he's definitely talking the talk too, and it would be easy to just shoot through his, uh, you know, his roster of all-star luminaries that he's played with over the years. And yet, when the guy blows on the trumpet, it certainly sounds like he's got this sound. Like, oh well, he must be the real deal. And yes, like you said, the fact that he was able to handle that instrument, that brass instrument, in such a way that there's almost no questions, there's no holes in his performance. Yeah. But he adds this great, you know, the mentor thing, the warmth, the fact that he's this great, uh, the, the picture of him on the on the Suzuki, you know, there's so many great little pieces of his character when he shows up. He looks alone from the rest of the guys because he's of a different generation. You know, he, he adds a lot of fun. And it's funny because like with, with, with the when the band is formed and you get to meet the commitment debts, you know, it's always, you're all thinking like, Who's going to end up with the, Who's going to end up with Angelina Ball, or who's going Who's going to end up with uh, Imelda. Imelda Quirk, you know? And uh, it turns out it's Joey Delips who ends up with all three of them, you know, <laughs> which kind of leads to the fragmentation a little bit towards the end of the band itself. But um, it's just great that part. It's great that it's Joey Delips. He's the ladies' man with his Isaac Hayes records. <laughs> well, I mean, it makes sense. Again, part of you you might think that part of Joey's spiel, his uh, his running line is that he's knocked over a lot of groupies in a lot of places. Let's say he has gone out with Wilson Pickett, let's say he hasn't. One thing is that I know he's um, had a lot of encounters backstage with a lot of impressionable young women, and, and even though he's sort of getting on in years, he's still got, he's working the last few embers of his charm, you know? Yeah. And again, that's just another bit of that, you know, whatever Johnny Murphy puts in that character, it's so believable. It's just another flavor, another, like, uh, wrinkle, a little bit of depth. Again, some people forget about these things. And I, again, like you say, a lot of these other actors were playing one dimension beautifully. They were only asked to do a certain thing, and they yeah. do that really well. In that respect, it's almost like watching actors in a teen movie. It's fun as shit, but you're not going to expect a big revelation from that. And you expect the other actors to provide uh, the sort of depth and the warmth, and, you know, spelling out the arc, and Johnny Murphy is able to do that. Yeah. And of course, the the, the drummer, the the, the red haired guy who, who the uh, the proprietor of the uh, pawn shop famously shouts, Oi, Ginger, shut the fuck up! Yeah, you know, when he's banging away in the window, you know, but uh, and he, his part is uh, he becomes precarious with the band because uh, he sees the other people. First of all, Deco starts playing his drums, and then uh, Mika don't fuck with me, Wallace. He takes over as the drummer in the band when the other guy quits, you know. And he, but but the, the drummer says to the Deco character, you know, you you, know, you can't play. He says, that's not that fucking difficult. He says, well, coordination and skill, like two things you lack or something like that. Yeah. But I love how quickly Jimmy turns on the drummer when the drummer shows up for the big the photo day when they're going to try to capture capture all that urban decay, and he announces that he's leaving the band. And for a brief moment, Jimmy's like, oh come on, like Deco's not worth getting like that that mad about. But once he realizes the drummer's leaving for good, Jimmy Meal starts like he starts kicking, kicking the, the band, band as well, yeah. like. Everybody's got a little bit of a savage side, which is what I love. Like everybody can give as good as they get. Everybody's got like a fucking razor sharp tongue, and I just, you, Bill was talking about earlier how there's a little bit of, of an edge to this movie, no matter how optimistic and positive it is, and that's what keeps it from being sentimental. It's what keeps it from from, from becoming shit, because so many musicals become pure, unbridled shit from start to finish because of that they just that loathsome sentimentality. There's not a sentimental scene in the entire movie. Yeah, no, absolutely. Because there's, there's always that uh, cynical side of this, the cynical Dublin. And uh, as you said, when, when he when he quits the band, he even offers Jimmy, he says, you can hold, you can use the drum kit till you find another one. And he's like, fuck you, we don't need you, we don't need a fucking drums. <laughs> yeah, or like when Jimmy's recruiting reporters to come cover their gigs, and the reporter's like, ah, oh, I see a reporter from like the, such and such paper, and he's like, ah, oh, Dublin's a small town. But like, everybody's 
playing an angle. Everybody's out to like you know, it's it's a th as, as Jimmy says himself, it's a third world country. What can you do? Like everybody's just trying to survive. <laughs> and you know the the movie all together, it has a lot of warmth, but it also has this great bite to it as well. There's 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 this, there's a sarcasm. There's a wit. There's a little bit of a, a, an acid bite to it, and a little bit of char on top, which counteracts that you know. A lot of Irish movies, I think, that sell across the border have schmaltz. They are really uh, this folksy image of what people want the Irish to be. And one of the things about the commitments is that it pushes back at that. It, it's like you're heralding, charging towards the new millennium, opening the 1990s up by saying, this is not the 1950s. This, we're not going to talk about potatoes. We're not going to talk about tartan. We're not going to talk about bagpipes or you know, anything that, that the Americans love to think about the Irish people. This is a completely different picture of modern, you know, modern Dublin, yeah. modern Ireland, and I love the fact that Johnny Murphy anchors that because it is, again, there's warmth, but there's a little bit of a knowing cynicism to him as well. You know, it's like he kind of knows all how all this stuff is going to end, and he just says, "I just want to jam. I just want to keep my my chops up. I just want to play," and you just totally believe him. Yeah, and like. In, in, in the in, towards the end of the movie, Jimmy Rabbit says to him, "Like you know, I believe you. I'm the only one that fucking did believe it, you know." And, and then you find out that he he actually was who he said he was. I mean, when when he first appears, uh, Colin Meany comes in and says, "Wait, you see the, the fucker that's out to see you there now." And, and then the following scene, after he's met Joey Lips, he goes back in and, and the father says, "Well," and he says, "God sent him what on a fucking Suzuki." You know? <laughs> brilliant line, you know, brilliant line. You know, you mentioned Colin Meany. Uh, that guy, if you want to make a through line, you know, he he can almost make the case for greatest Irish actor of I would say the last thirty or forty years. Not just because he is an incredible performer, you know, he's got stage chops, the guy's been working for a long time, he has jumped from genre to genre to project to project, he has had hustle, and this stick to that's kept him in the game with all these different generations, all these different projects, all these different filmmakers, where he's a chameleon, and he out-hustles people, but you know what, his face, again, you see him as Jimmy Rabbit's dad, there is this nice wrinkled kind of, uh, I don't know, prematurely aged man a little bit. He's sort of stuck. And I love the fact that he's, you know, you believe his Elvis adherence too. Uh, but at the same time, he's warm. It's a take no shit character, the way yeah. we want TV dads to be or movie dads to be, where you're, be you're benign, you're a little out of it, but you're still benign. You know, you're a good, warm, fatherly figure. Uh, and that's why, it, again, another, in addition to Johnny Murphy, having these, uh, these actors who are really trained actors, these, these concrete figures to anchor a movie on is so important. Yeah, and I'm sure they helped the, the, the young, un unprofessional cast to kind of master and be believable in, in their parts, you know? Yeah. So it's the commitments the big midnight movie of the 90s for Ireland? I mean, was it playing round the clock? Oh yeah, well, so, so when, when the commitments first came out, um, certain cinemas, uh, the Savoy in Dublin, they played 24 hours, you know, which, which they had never done for any film. So you, you could go there at two o'clock in the morning. You said Dublin goes to sleep, like, you know, yeah. yeah. Absolutely, D Dublin closes down, so it's not a 24 hour city, but back in 1991, um, the Savoy cinema decided to just run it on a loop, so it can, once, and people, some people just went and watched it again and again and again, you know. So yeah, it had a huge impact on on uh, everybody, and it, it was the start of what came to be known as the, the Celtic Tiger. Because when you look back at the commitments today, you can see how dilapidated Dublin was, the, the, how dirty the city looked, the and cinder block walls, and the dogs. All of that, and, and, yeah. and it's called a Dublin that doesn't exist anymore. As we'll see when we look at some of the other locations, uh, Dublin's changed quite a lot, and, and the, the commitments is kind of like a, a record of what it was like pre-Celtic Tiger and pre-boom pre years, you know. So, um, yeah, it, 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 but, but it's the Dublin that I remember as a child growing up and as a young teenager. That was, that was the Dublin that I remembered best, you know.
when I was when I was a kid growing up, every Sunday my parents would drive from where I live in Sandyford out to my out to my grandparents' house, who who, who live on the other side of the, the Phoenix Park. And for some reason, we as we were driving past here, my father would always go, "Checkpoint Charlie," and I didn't know what the fuck he was talking about, you know. And every time he's like, "Checkpoint Charlie," and just for years, we just didn't know why. I just thought he was a bit strange, which he was, you know. But um, and then years later, I'm watching um, the spy come in from the cold, and of course I, I, I look up online about it, and I read it's actually filmed in Dublin. And Checkpoint Charlie was this spot here, which is a Smithfield in Dublin, and uh, it all it all suddenly made sense, you know what I mean? And but my father was dead at that point, so I, I wasn't able to actually say to him, you know. But yeah, Checkpoint Charlie it, back back in uh, 1965, I think it was when uh, Martin Ritt came over here to make uh, the spy who came in from the cold. Um, Dublin looked like East Berlin. You know what I mean? It was yeah. it was pretty pretty, pretty grim and dilapidated. There wasn't all the all these buildings here are new now. You know, those the the the, the, uh, the Jemison um, distilleries there, but the, everything else was just uh, derelict buildings, run down. There was there was a, a market here. There was a the horse market and the junk market and stuff like that. But everything was just uh, falling apart, and it, it could have been East Berlin. It looked like bomb damage, even though we weren't in the war. You know, so um, <laughs> that's wild. <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely. So, so the, they come over here. They shot most of the film in Ardmore Studios, but the exterior for Checkpoint Charlie was here. And uh, of course, you know, he had he had Richard Burton over here, and uh, Martin Ritt and Richard Burton didn't really hit it off very well. I think um, be because of uh, Elizabeth Taylor was there as well. And that was in the middle. Of, yeah, the, the big '60s to '70s doldrums. Of, I mean, Elizabeth Taylor and Dick Burton going at it like cats and dogs. Multiple marriages. A, a tempestuous uh, marriage for all of history, perhaps one of the most legendary showbiz marriages of all time, if not the apex of such a thing. And, and Martin Ritt described uh, Richard Burton like uh, like an old whore who's just had <laughs> who's just had his la last lay, you know. And uh, <laughs> that, that says it all about their about their um, relationship, you know. But I mean, Martin Ritt, you know, guy he blacklisted in the, in the early fifties. Uh, he he made some spectacular films, westerns, Hood, yeah, uh, uh, what's you know, Hombre, or um, and then you know, a lot of actors who worked for him that ended up winning Oscars. You know, you had yeah. Sally Field and Norma Ray yeah, and yeah, yeah. various other actors, actors, actresses who uh, got Oscars. You know, he's a big, big director, and I've always been a big fan of his work. You know. Yeah, he's uh, one of those seminal middle of the century American directors. Yeah, I saw just recently. I saw his last movie. Nuts, uh, which was a Barbra Streisand. Uh, yeah, that was a little bit of a weird exploit. I think that movie was made 10 or 15 years too late. But you, know, you can see Marty Ritt's intelligence. Uh, you know, he really works himself through a plot that's dense with material, dense with questions, dense with a lot of facts that needs a lot of, um, I mean, in, in a word, le carré. I mean, that talk about a guy uh, who has completely stumped filmmakers, good ones for a long time. It's really a puzzle that you have to get through this and somehow make it interesting. You've got to trans translate what he was doing in the, in the pages of the book, and so, I mean, which is very cinematic, but it requires another level. You have to be able to see past the deception that soaks, I mean, uh, soaks every single image of it. And in this movie, so much of it is built on deception, as yeah. all those smiley, uh, smiley stories are. Uh, if you're gonna make a good one, and I think that, you know, they may have fought like cats and dogs over it. However, Dick Burton gives an incredible performance. Well, I mean, he has to play a guy who's uh, fallen apart with alcohol sort of stuff. So he, he had a bit of practice at, the, at, at that <laughs> stage, you know. But, um, but we do, we get to see one of the iconic characters, George Smiley, who, who featured in, I don't know, maybe six of Le Carre's novels. And uh, I think in this he was played by uh, was Rupert Davis. Yeah. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's a small role, but it's an important role. And we would, we would see that again. We would see Smiley appear with Alec Guinness playing him in, in this, the uh, Tinker Taylor Soldier Spy and Smiley's people in the early 80s. And then, of course, Gary, um, Oldman. Gary Oldman. And uh, yeah, so it, it, it's, uh, it was an iconic uh, character, but uh, Richard Burton. And, and uh, in, funny, in, in Le Carre's last book, The Legacy of Spies, um, they re he revisits the entire plot of The Spy that Came In From The Cold. Uh, one of the characters from uh, the Tinker Taylor Soldier Spy he is reinvestigating what happened back when Richard Burton's character was uh, all this trouble and he, got, he ended up getting killed, you know, yeah. spoiler alert. But, um, but yeah, so it's a really great story, Cold War, and you know, you got 
Oscar War Werner in there, who just gets such a, such a great performance. Yeah, <laughs> let me let me tell you, when Oscar Werner shows, look, I mean, I've seen a bunch of Oscar Werner movies. He's great in Jules and Jim and and, and Fahrenheit four five one. You know, the thing is, this movie is, is going along at one pace, and there's there's all these Anglo actors doing a thing, and you know, uh, uh, the Welsh champion himself, Richard Burton, at the peak of his uh, powers, just before his inexorable slide down to weird weirdness. The thing is, uh, once they get over to the movie's conception of um, Germany. Oscar Werner shows up and he injects this energy into the movie. He is doing something different technique-wise than the rest of his uh, uh, commiserates in the film. And it's just, it's, it's almost like, again, the movie's great up until that point. But it like takes a left turn with his energy. Yeah. It's the way he's speaking. It's the way he comes in. He brings in this idea. He plays Fiedler. He's a you know a Jew who's working for the fascist apparatus, and his en his enemy is a German who's an anti-Semite. And the two of them are having a power struggle behind yeah. the scenes. Uh, and you know whatever it is that Oscar Werner manages to inject in there, and the way he does it, again, it must have looked like when uh, Marlon Brando was kind of like giving his his uh, Stella Adler actor studio type of acting, and you know him next to another actor was a big contrast and that that energy that juice that came from those two yeah. things was like stunning to see yeah and yeah no it's, it's just one of those i mean for me because i've always been a big fan of the carry and and, and I, I just love these little connections especially because i'm from dublin and in in this spot uh, smithfield you know to, to, to have to have that as as part of the, that's great i could i could see it i mean i, I could totally see it it's yeah. still got all the cobblestone yeah. here and, and you, you, you could imagine the space is open it's, it's per made for it, perfect it, it's yeah. perfect it's know? archaeology it's wonderful yeah so yeah i mean that, that's the thing like there was so so many um films come over here to to shoot because of these dilapidated but uh, iconic uh, areas, you know. Can I make another Irish film connection? Yes. So, um, uh, and Mr. Ash, who's one of those people who comes to him trying to, you know, he's an East German guy trying to get him out because he's trying to make him in uh, in, in, in London, is played by Michael Hordern, who okay. was the narrator. Barry Lyndon. Oh, Barry Lyndon. Yeah. Of course. Because for, for me, he, he's uh, for, he, he's uh, Admiral Rollin from the where he goes there. You know yeah. what I mean? I just <laughs> watching Barry Lyndon again and hearing those like velvety chocolatey tones yeah, coming yeah, through. Yeah, I was yeah, like, oh, yeah. that's the same guy. That's my quarter. Uh, and I love to see his face in something. He looks pretty. Yeah. And he was great. It was almost like a little disgraced roll up to the side. He sort of shuffled through. That was pretty awesome. Yeah. No, it's, 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 it's a classic. And if you, I mean, I, I don't know. I always try to recommend people Spy Me from the Cold. Even because I, I, I've seen that many times before I ever saw it. Uh, the original Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy or the Gary Oldman uh, remake of it. So um, for me, Spy Who Commit in the Cold is, is the ultimate Cold War movie, yeah. you know? It's charcoal gray. It doesn't end uh, happily. It is filled with yeah. this, this relenting, unrelenting dread. And you forget how, um, I mean, as, as much as it was a bitch to live through, and again, I, I was a teenager by the time the wall fell, and so I didn't have the Cold War to, to fall back on. It was an amazing setting for stories because it wasn't just the, it wasn't theatrical, it wasn't academic, it was real. You know, these things and the thing yeah. is, Le Carre made spy craft, or trade craft, they call it. It really is just a game of small glances and handshakes and indicators and whatnot. It's not guys swinging in or unzipping a wetsuit and having a tuxedo. Yeah. Even though we love those oh, things. Yeah. It looks so much more like this: these guys, drunken guys, louche guys, selling, sending people down the river, knowing full well that their their marks are going to get assassinated and that these CIs Absolutely. are just pretty much dangled, sacrificed later on. That stuff is so grim. Yeah. And it makes a great film. Yeah, absolutely. So there you have it. Four iconic films by four iconic film directors. Dublin has changed a lot in the 50 years since Sergio Leone was here. These days, if you come visit, you'll find a mix of the old and the new. But keep an eye out, because you never know in whose footsteps you'll be walking. In part two, our cinematic journey will take us out of Dublin to the hills of County Wicklow, where we will tread the paths taken by John Borman and Stanley Kubrick. And finally, we'll end up back in Dublin at one of the most iconic film locations in Ireland, which has featured in over 20 films. See you in part two.